I've spent 30, 40 years working with patients that have retinitis pigmentosa, and our view of the disease has changed dramatically, especially in the last 10, 15 years. So we've always known that it was a genetically inherited condition, and we knew there were X-linked and dominant and recessive forms, um, but we didn't really know the genes. And starting, you know, maybe around early 90, 1990s, uh, the first few genes, first couple of genes to cause RP were identified, and we thought, you know, wow, we, we understand this now. Turns out that's two of about 150. So in the last 10 years, we've been identifying many, many, many new genes. And so really we're, the, the, the thinking about retinitis pigmentosa is evolving. So rather than thinking of it as one disease, uh, we now think of it as a whole group of diseases, each with a different genetic cause, but having all having certain uh, properties in, in common. And sort of the, the typical RP, although there's just all kinds of ex exceptions, the absolutely typical case is, is a, a patient who's um, aware of night vision problems early in life, maybe in their, as a child or in early teens, they, they realize that they can't find their seat in the movie theater. They can't get around as well at nighttime. And they often, um, you know, sort of don't take it that seriously initially. They, they think, well, it's just something that, that's happening. But following that early night blindness, they start to get some visual field loss defects. They're blind spots. And they realize that they're missing things off to the side. And that's when they really tend to come in to, to, be, di to be tested and diagnosed. And so usually in, in the late teens, Patients get the diagnosis. Uh, at this point, they're given genetic testing just to identify the gene. And we tell them as much as we can, you know, about the, the prognosis, the future based on the, on the genetics. Uh, we identify other people in the family maybe that have it and uh, take it from there. And so, you know, they, they currently they're, they're coming in every couple of years to see an ophthalmologist. They're aware that their visual field is getting worse and, uh, usually it, it begins as sort of a, what's called a mid-peripheral scotoma. So you've got sort of a blind spot, blind area around the center. So they can see well in the center, they can see well in the far periphery, you know, way off the edges, but there's a whole region in between where they don't see well. And that gets, uh, that comes in, that comes in and goes out. So they lose the, the far periphery eventually, and it begins to impinge upon the center. And you know, depending on the stage, they experience um, different degrees of loss. So they, they uh, often give up driving because they realize, you know, there's a lot going on to the side that they can't see. They begin uh, having accidents or, or, and falling. You know, they, they have problems with steps and, and uh, get hit by tree branches. You know, there are lots of things that um, they drop something, they can't find it. You know, there are all kinds of... Um, disabilities that are, are accompany this, this visual loss. But I think the real uh, fear cuts in when they, when they realize that that center is getting smaller and smaller, you know, and they, they fear that they're going to lose the whole center and be legally blind. And that does happen, unfortunately, to, you know, fair percentage of patients.